Yeah, so uh, I live in Sarasota. I've got a family. I do music. I like it on the beach. I've worked on quite a few enterprise level WooCommerce sites. Um, around five years experience, and I still haven't mastered it. Um, is that the is from the uh, Blades of Glory? No, that's me and my daughter went ice skating a few weeks ago, and we wore matching outfits. So, yeah. <laughs> we did try to pull off our best with Blades of Glory. Um, that's where you can find me. I don't tweet much, but I'm on there and I do listen to it. Um, so if you ever have any questions or want to chat Lou, you can hit me up. Um, I woke up at 3.30 this morning and drove up here from Sarasota, so if I seem a little sluggish, that's probably why. Um, it's also a lot colder here than it was in Sarasota. I wasn't expecting that. How, how, like how are you? Short? Yeah, I show up, I'm freezing as I'm getting gas <laughs> right off the interstate. Um, this is my second time giving this talk. The first time I was in Miami a few weeks ago and uh, learned a lot from that. They were my guinea pigs. I changed it up a bit, added some new slides. Um, so hopefully it's pretty smooth and we get something out of it. Uh, this is a back-end development focused talk. Um, it's pretty advanced level, but uh, there are some kind of high level concepts we go over, so you might get something out of it, even if you aren't um, a really advanced developer. And feel free to interrupt me. Um, I'm always happy to talk, discuss, dig deeper into things y'all find interesting. So uh, it's, it's hard, pretty much impossible to, to go over advanced development for WooCommerce without just talking about PHP development and WordPress development in general. So a lot of this can be kind of extrapolated and, and put into any other things you do um, behind the scenes in WordPress. And these are kind of sections we're going to go through. Um, I had a live coding watch me try to figure out a problem thing when I was in Miami. That was just weird. It just didn't work. So I took that section out and added some more just kind of digging into different things you can do. Um, so let's start off with how do we woo. <laughs> First and most important thing with WooCommerce that I've learned is you're dealing with real money, people's money, sometimes millions of dollars. And all of these numbers that you're calculating and adjusting are going to get sent to the IRS, they're going to be sent to their accountants, they're going to be matched up with different databases and Excel spreadsheets. So you have to be very careful and very accurate. Like Woo will calculate down to like the fifth decimal place, decimal place if you want them to. Um, so I highly recommend, you know, lots of integration tests. Um, double checking all your numbers, a lot of QA work. WooCommerce isn't something you just kind of hack together, especially when you're going to be touching money amounts and report sheets and exports and things like that. Um, it's good if you're doing a bigger project to have clear end goal and end product. You know, what's the user story, wireframe it up, do all the preparation correctly before you dive in and start actually tweaking WooCommerce's abilities. Uh, so let's talk about a user story. I'm going to kind of built an example in here that's based on a project I'm building with Tribe. Um, so going through this, kind of give us an idea of what the project's going to do, what we wanted to do, how we approach it, and we're going to go through all those steps. So let's think about this. Our users are resellers. The people shopping on the site are going to be people who buy products, probably in bulk, and resell them for a higher profit amount. So we need to think about how to approach them, how to give them the features they need on this shopping cart system. Um, depending on the type of person shopping, the type of reseller, they're going to see different products, see different prices, different situations are going to come up depending on what is set for that specific user that's shopping. Um, we want to add a feature where the users can save their shopping carts so they can put 100 bulk items into a shopping cart, set it aside, do that a few different times, come back and purchase them as they need. Um, that kind of advanced functionality uh, is not default in um, the user should know the price at which they can resell, so we want to be able to show them what their profit margins are going to look like as they're shopping around. Um, some, some products are going to require licenses. Uh, a lot of people would approach that sort of thing with EDD. Um, we built a custom solution because our client needed a very customized solution, so um, let's just kind of throw that in the mix here while we're thinking about what we're doing. Uh, the first step is to get a strategist, or be the strategist if you're doing a project, to help kind of line out what is going to happen here and how. So with WooCommerce, you can kind of separate it into these different buckets of the user, the shop, the cart, the checkout, um, how, how the managers and the admins are going to be handling the back-end orders and, and handling users and so forth. Um, so kind of you can set out a table, you can do it however you want. This is kind of the thing that I see from uh, my strategist. Um, so the user, what are we going to do with the user? We're going to have the My Account section is going to have some special stuff. It's going to have custom fields since we are going to have these resellers and different types of users. Um, we're going to have a custom licenses archive. So if they buy these products that come with licenses, they'll be able to go to their archive and their loop and see what those are, what they have, and the status of them. Um, the user types, 
you know, do we use a meta field? Are we going to use user roles? How are we going to manage this whole part of it? But we know that something has to happen there. Um, the shop loops, they're going to be different. We're going to be adjusting the loop queries based on what kind of users shopping there. Um, products are going to have custom fields, um, custom order statuses, you know. Woo comes with like four or five pending, processing, on hold, complete. It comes with these statuses, so we're going to want to add some custom ones for ourselves, pending a license, pending verification. Uh, we're going to need custom email templates to go with those statuses. Carts, we've got calculated columns, save the cart feature we want. Gateways, we're going to need like an account receivable kind of gateway. Um, managing it from the admin side, exports, uh, bulk sales, you know, if they want to set everything on sale at 10% at the same time, we need to build some sort of feature where they can manage those types of things. Um, and then managing, you know, if users have safe carts, the admin is going to want to be able to see those, adjust them, remove them, and so forth. And this is just a quick shot. Um, you can get a lot more intense, these kind of layouts uh, before you start coding. Um, plugins are the plugins we can use to kind of save time and recreate in the wheel here. And I highly recommend using them. I mean, if you need a UPS shipping functionality, don't build it. Woo has one that's official that works really well. Um, so anything that's officially licensed or sold through Woo can be trusted for the most part. Um, you can use uh, third-party plugins if you need to, but hopefully, of course, you'll probably already know, look for some really high rated and, and uh, kept updated versions of, of plugins that you use. Um, so then kind of go through a list of checking out <coughs> what pieces of WooCommerce we're going to be touching in our extensions and our, our development. Uh, for this one, we're we'll be touching product meta, order meta, order item meta, uh, customer meta, templates, prices, and taxes. Taxes are <coughs> intense. Um, gateways, custom order statuses, imports, exports, and so on. Uh, so are we touch on one or two things. You know we can build a really simple plugin to maybe just a single file. But for something like this, you're going to want to build somewhat of a framework in your plugin. Um, so this is how Woo is structured, simplified. Um, we have our post types. The main post types that WooCommerce registers is the product, the product variation, the shop order, and the coupon. Now they have some other post types they use, but these are the these are the big dogs, the main ones that, that you're going to be messing with. So are they still storing transactional data in the post? Transactional data? Oh no, no. We'll shop that. The shop That's, order. The shop order is a post type, and it is simply it's since there's an admin interface for managing it, like you do any other post type, they they store the main shop order ID as a post type. Oh, um, but they have order items and order item meta for their custom tables, the main ones that they use. So when somebody orders a product, it basically takes a copy of that product and creates an order item. So if you go and change the product later, it's not going to affect what the person bought. It's going to stay the same on that in that custom table. And those order items are related to shop shops in that custom table or shop I or Jesus order IDs in that custom table, and then. Those order IDs are the post type itself. So it doesn't actually use post meta to, for an order to kind of store what people bought in the transactional data. So it's got this custom table. Um, it's also got a table for tax rates, payment tokens, um, payment methods that people want to save, like Stripe lets you save a card, they keep it in that table. Those are smaller tables, smaller uses. They aren't really mixed into the big picture as much. Uh, the order item and the order item beta are the main custom tables that get a lot of action and are very important. Uh, we uses uh, <coughs> classes for a lot of stuff. It's very object based. The order object is a, is a big one and the product object is a big one. Um, it's, they call it an abstract class in their documentation, but it's not really. You can create just um, instances of product with a product ID and get a lot of the, the methods that come along with that. Uh, but they do have the product variation, variable, and simple, which are extensions of the WC product that have specialized methods just for those particular items. Um, you all know a variation product versus a simple product. Kind of, well, a simple product is it's a product, it's got a price, it can have different features to it and so forth. Uh, a variable product allows you to have variations, and each one of those variations is its own kind of product. So it can get very hairy when you're dealing with complex systems. 
you have to make sure you account for the different variations is versus bundle, the simple product. Is bundle just not listed, or do bundle? They, is, do they consider bundle like a, a single product, a simple product? So no. They don't have a bundle. So there's no bundle. You have to have an add-on for that. And in fact, we're going to build a bundle in one of my demos that I'm doing because it's a very needed feature fairly often. Um, the API is good. It's got a lot of helper functions that you can use. Um, the WC function gets you the WooCommerce object. And uh, yeah, so it gives you access basically whatever you need. You can get to the cart, the current session and the current cart through the WC object. Um, yeah, so we'll see some of this actual code. Uh, the meta. So Woo provides um, helper functions for creating form fields. You can create your own meta fields if you want. However you want, you can use ACF. You can just, you know, hook into add meta box and make your own things. But it's highly suggested you stick with the Woo standard and use their input fields for meta. Um, since they add attributes to classes and mix it in with their JS and everything, it just keeps everything standardized in, in, in the shop. And a lot of times it seems like there's really no reason for all of that. But then a month down the road, you realize your fields aren't tying into a certain area of the, of the WooCommerce environment that they should be. It just helps avoid a lot of disasters. Um, conditional meta val value returns are pretty cool. We're going to actually get more into that in a minute, so I won't go too, too detailed there. Um, order items, I, I just explained that to you all. The order items are different than a product. They're a snapshot, snapshot of the product at checkout. Um, okay, these are the fields I'm talking about. So they provide these functions. You can just build these. It'll echo out the field with all the correct WooCommerce markup on it and make everything unified. Although you do, it doesn't like save it for you. You have to hook in and update the post meta and so forth. But as you see here, this is one um, it shows you that the classes that it attaches to it. it. It provides the date picker that is kind of the Woo standard back there. It keeps everything Bless together. Splash it. Um, this is what I was talking about. Kind of conditional meta. We do this for a lot of things at Tribe, but. If you build a wrapper class around the WooCommerce product and use your own get meta method, if you want to adjust that meta as it's coming out, this gives you that, that power. So you can do like, uh, like you've got this method you built. Um, if it's not the keys that you're allowing people to get, or your code to get, and you, know, you can just return, um, then you can switch here. You can have your default that just gets the meta from WooCommerce. Or if it's a certain thing, like reseller price, Let's check if what kind of user this is and see if we need to adjust what the price we're getting here is and return that instead. So it gives you a lot more power than just get post meta. Um, gateways. So gateways are literally, they convert the cart to an order post type. What happens between that is up to the gateway. So if you're building your own custom gateways, it gives you a lot of power. You can use a different card processor. You can do things that like, uh, I'll kind of show you in a second, yeah, but there's a, there's a lot of really cool things you can do with gateways. You don't have to take payments. You can just make a card go to an order, and then your company does something special with that process. Um, we're going to go more into this later as well, but there's two different ways that Wu checks you out. One of them is the standard way with Ajax. You go through the normal checkout process, and then boom, you've got your order. And the other is um, they have a short code order form built into a WooCommerce where you can slap an order form onto any page template that you want, or um, if you want people to be able to like save these cards like we're talking about and turn them into orders, you can build your whole functionality there and use the short code order form, but it works differently. So you gotta realize when you're writing your checkout code, if there's things you do during the checkout process, you gotta make sure you're ready to handle both directions. People can get to that area and create their order. Yeah, that's what really making sense. All right, custom statuses. These are, they seem like a small thing, but they're actually really powerful and, and really easy to integrate with. Um, so Woo comes with the, the basic ones, processing, completed, pending, and on hold. And then they provide this filter, WC order statuses, where you can filter into it and add any custom statuses you want. It does have to start with WC dash in order for WooCommerce to recognize it. Um, used for custom order types. So when I was talking about how we need people to be able to save cards and stuff like that, we uh, could call it estimates, right? So people can save an estimate. Um, and what they could do is we can create an order with our own custom payment gateway and set it to a custom status. So 
Blue's not going to recognize it as completed or processing, and we can recognize it to do whatever we want with. And otherwise, you just have this kind of saved record of an order that hasn't gone through yet. You can call it whatever you want. We call it estimates in this. Um, custom status, all statuses have the option in WooCommerce to send out an email. You can turn it on or off. Whenever it goes to this status, send out an email telling the user whatever. So if you have your own custom statuses, you need to build those email templates as well and register them as an email with, uh, with Woo so they know that you can turn it on or off as an admin. Let's actually look at one. Oops. I don't, I think this links. Yeah. Okay. So here's a example of custom payment gateway called estimates that kind of does what I was talking about. Um, so to make a gateway, you extend the WC payment gateway class. You set an ID, and then this constant's our own that we're going to be using. It's not required by Woo. On the construct, you need to do certain things that are required by WooCommerce, such as setting an ID. Um, these things allow, these guys right here allow the admin to see, you know, a, a name and an explanation of what the gateway is within the admin settings. And then you need a filter into available payment gateways to register your gateway with WooCommerce. And what we're doing here is pretty cool. So when we're registering our payment gateway, we go into a function called check access. So maybe we don't want estimates to be available to every single shopper that's hitting up your site. So first we say, is this an admin? Okay, then we'll return it and say, then leave the cool custom gateway in there because you're on the admin side. You want to be able to set all your settings. Um, is the user not logged in? Okay, they can't do estimates. So we're going to uh, unset our self estimates gateway and then return the gateways to Woo. Uh, is the user, well, we have, let's just say we have this user object that we created that um, does a lot of checks and methods and stuff for us, allows us to give some user powers. Uh, we have a function in there called can access quotes. If they can't, then we unset the gateway and remove it. But this is a conditional gateway. It's a gateway that only certain user types are, have available. And um, yeah, so pretty neat. Um, all gateways have a process payment function. This is what we will hit when a person is checking out with your gateway. They look for this function, and this is where you would reach out to the API and process the payment, and then return false or true, and turn it into an order, and so forth. For this one, um, we aren't going to look for payment. We are simply going to reduce our stocks, because at least on the product I was working on and for this demo, we want those items that they put into an estimate to be on hold for them. You know, we don't want to run out of stock and then they decide to turn their estimate into an order. Is there some type of automation in there if they cancel the order, if it fails, if the, the stop bubbles are returned? No, you'd have to build that. Like That's we built that. Not, not, yeah. not in this demo, there's not, but in the actual full giant one we built, there is. Um, so reduce stock levels. And then we update the order status to our custom status that we have here, WC status for this class, um, WC estimate. So that is going to generate an order, give it that status. So when we are in the admin and looking at this order, we'll say this right here, awaiting estimate confirmation. Um, we empty the user's cart, and then we return success and send them to some custom thank you page that we have just for this gateway. Um, down here, as you see, we hook in to add our status, and this is also where we filter something. Oh, this is where we put our gateway into the, the mix with WooCommerce. So that's a pretty cool little, little sample there. Let's go back up. Uh, templates. So like I said, I, I do back end for um, Tribe. I don't really touch the front end much, but um, our front end guys that we work with, they do this. This is, this is just how you need to approach when you're building a custom shop or custom features for WooCommerce. Use their templating system. They have it within the, the folder. You go in the, the plugin folder, WooCommerce slash templates, and you can see their structure um, for everything. For uh, the, the My Account loops, for the shop, for the checkout forms, all that stuff is in there. So if you're, and all you have to do is create the same thing in your theme or sub theme, put that file in and make it how you want it to be. And then, you know, WooCommerce will use yours instead of their default one. Um, you want to keep all the actions and filters that Woo has in place if you can. Um, if you are 100% sure you don't need those in there, then don't. But those actions that they do, like uh, 
uh, pre-checkout form action and post-checkout form action, those do more than just display things. They handle a lot of the, the, the section functionality and, and making sure that you're displaying the right stuff for the user that's checking out at that time. Um, keep any logic you have in the custom plugin. That's, that's what we preach. Um, we try to keep our logic and our views separated, and it really does help in the long run to, to do that. And talking about simple plugin, um, if you're only touching one or two things, there's really no problem with that. So I just say do it. But if you're going big, go big. I'll kind of show you what a simple plugin looks like. I mean, that's it. It's one file in a plugin folder. Um, it's got a name. And all this does is puts a little message after the add to cart button on every product. If you're doing something really simple like that, just do it this way. Make a file, put a few actions and filters in it, and be, call it a day. But that's not what this talk's about. This is talk is about the big ones, the big crap. <coughs> Building a framework. So this is this is what I do most of the time when when we're extending WooCommerce at my day job, you know, and and uh, it's it's pretty cool. So I do it the tribe way. That's why I'm going to kind of show you all here. Um, as long as you know, there's there's a million ways to do it the right way. So this is just kind of how I approach it. But definitely the organization, the separation of logic and views, all that stuff can really be important and, and helpful in, in long term development. I highly recommend it. We use con containers and uh, dependency injections at Tribe. I'm not going to use that in this mock-up, but I definitely recommend looking into it um, if you're building a big WooCommerce extension. Uh, I highly suggest using the right tools. We use PHP Storm. Um, I definitely, it's definitely the best IDD in my opinion for, for this kind of development, but there's many other ones that are arguably just as good. Um, Xdebug and breakpoints, that's something that took me from one level of developer to another. Like, it's a big level up tool. If you aren't using breakpoints, yeah, it's huge. It's massive. You aren't like before that. You're fair dumping all your variables right, you know, onto the screen. And you're dying with messages. Yeah. So uh, it's a it's a game. Um, recursively searching directories is one of the coolest things I love about these these beautiful IDEs. Is uh, say you want to use a woo filter and you want to make sure there's no other plugins or something else using that same one, or you want to know what's happening. You can, you can recursively search keywords through your entire directories. And since PHP Storm indexes, it, it's really fast. And you can see every use of that filter. And um, yeah, it's really One cool. you didn't mention there is the control clicking of functions, actions. Can you do with actions? Uh, uh, actions, if there's actions that if you enable the WordPress functionality in there, which you have to define your, your WordPress core, yeah. it puts the, uh, like you, you have to hit your breakpoints on the left bar with the red dot, there's going to be a blue dot linking just like the classes where they extend another class. I never noticed that. It takes you directly really to the... Cool. I mean, I do use the function one, which is really neat, like, um, so... <coughs> no, you must not have it enabled. I up, guess not. If you go up to your settings, I can show you where it's at. I'm with you, Chris. I thought you were a WordPress developer. He's from the Joomla conference. Who's this poser out here? Get him off the stage. Um, I can't find a good one, but anyway, typically you can click on function, go to declaration, it'll take you to right where that is. So if you're using a Woo function, clicking. yeah, just control clicking, or right clicking. So if you the Woo function you're using, you want to see exactly what it's doing to your data, you can do that. Pop Same it in reverse. If you're trying to determine whether a function can be removed after it's been deprecated or something like uh -huh. that, control click it and it'll show you every word that it's been that's used. That's the implementations. Right, it's the opposite. So if you control click a function that's in use, like the is type right there, it'll take you to the is type declaration. But if you're at the declaration, and you should, yeah. This one right here, right? right yeah, find usages. Find usages? Yes, find usages is where it is, yeah. Up seven, up seven. Uh, I'm learning more than y'all are up here. <laughs> find usages, fantastic. The same thing happens if you control click the function name. It'll automatically pull up every, no, control click it. That was I'm control sorry, command command on here. Yeah, 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 my bad. Oh, obviously, really cool. obviously there's yeah. like one, so uh, it's a yeah. If there were 10, it would give you the drop down. It's the fine drop down. Very cool. And then, um, yeah. yeah we definitely use, use a local dedicated yeah. filters all the time. Yeah. A, a local desk setup is another big game changer if you haven't done it. Um, like, I, for years, I just FTP my files to a 
server somewhere and <laughs> tested it up there and, and changed it back and forth. It's, it's, it's growing as a developer, so I, I suspect maybe you'll Cowboy coding, and that's what you call that's it. That's what here? Josh called it. Um, he, he informed me he's not coming over to talk. So. Uh, namespace and auto load, definitely if you can. I know that if you're a product, selling product, and you have to be compatible, you can't do all this yes, yet. You can. you can. I'm PHP 5.2 and you not namespacing. Not namespace. We do auto, auto loading. Yeah, but you have to build your own auto loader, right? I mean, you can't. We use, just we use the same boot. No, since WordPress 3.6, 3.8, they can so they have their own SPO auto loader backwards compatible. Oh, I didn't know that. And basically, I just convert. I can I copied their file over in the case they're loading an older version of WordPress just mm -hmm. in case, and we in case they don't have SPO auto loader, we just load that compatibility file and then call it. Very cool. Well, I definitely highly recommend it. It helps a lot with the development process. Keeps things. Um, keeps you from having to do a lot more grunt work. Uh, so look it up if you haven't, and, and definitely start using it. It also allows, the, what I think namespacing does, like the most useful bit of it, is that you can use simple names for your classes. It's tight. You can name a class checkout, even though there's probably multiple other plugins that want to use that, that thing, or cart. Um, very simple names for your classes, because they're appropriately namespaced, which is like keeping it in a directory. Uh, version control is definitely another big important one. Um, again, I'm, I'm more I'm sitting here more on the proper development speech than actually WooCommerce. But uh, using Git gives you your historical data. It allows you to work with others well. It keeps um, it's just really really nice. Uh, so definitely highly recommend that. We like to commit the whole WordPress um, install with our work that we're working on. Uh, that way, everybody's working on the exact same version of WordPress. Um, we know that everyone's setup's identical, and when we want to update WordPress, QA can test it here, and we can be working on it there, and it's all centralized and in the same version and, and correct. We also put WordPress into a subdirectory, um, so our project is at the base, and then we tell where to load WordPress from. Um, I already mentioned this, but yeah, keep your keep the theme in the themes. Um, your front end stuff, your HTML, your assets, all that should stay in your theme. Keep your PHP logic in a, in a centralized place like a plugin. Um, don't be doing a lot of more than just a couple of like if checks or whatever in your uh, template files. It's just bad practice. Keep all that centralized in your PHP logic um, in the plugin. Uh, documenting is really a lot more important than it seems, even if you're working by yourself. Um, there's been times I've come back to code I wrote a month ago, and I'm thanking myself from a month ago for writing down what I did there. I mean, you, or, documentation is really important. What's that? More often cursing yourself for not doing it. Or that. cursing yourself. <laughs> Why didn't I write what this did? Or going back looking at code a year old, you're like, why did I? That doesn't even make sense. Where you're taking your project and somebody left, you know, eight months <laughs> like, when you what remove, is going on here? The worst part is you remove that because you're like, that doesn't even make sense there. And then all of a sudden, you just start reporting a bug, like yeah. a non random bug. And you're like, oh, that's uh, not put that back in there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I can't uh, push that enough. Definitely document your code, even if it's just a just a tiny little bit. Just do it. It also helps with um, when you're working on like PHP Storm. If you're documenting what your parameters are and what your returns are, when you're in another file calling that function, you'll get type hints and, and suggestions on what you can use there, what's wrong with it if you're pushing the wrong things in. Um, it's not that hard. In fact, I was going to say, and they, they basically push you to do them. Yeah. And it who, highlights all of your functions. And who does it? I mean, PHP Storm will do it automatically for you. If you just Alt slash, Alt insert, star, enter. Then it did nothing. I need two stars. I was going to say, if you, you can go a step further, too, and do alt, alt insert. Alt insert, just right here? Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do that on a map. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, slash star star, enter, and it automatically uh, puts in your inline documentation on that function. Um, yeah, yeah, that only does really one. If you do, it's just like you can insert override methods for a class you're working on, you can mass insert doc blocks for the entire file. Okay, so here's a, a, a kind of look at how I would structure a plugin that's doing a lot of a framework that's doing a lot of stuff in WooCommerce. We have our, our WooCommerce classes here on this side that we're thinking about as we're developing. We've got product, cart, gateways, and order. So in our plugin, let's wrap all of those in our own classes. You know, so we can do what we want to them within our wrapper class, but still have access to the actual core WooCommerce class. 
Um, so yeah, so we, we just kind of mock one of those up. I'll show you in a second. Then we have our assets, our utilities, our core and stuff. But I, this, this duplication or wrapping that we do really is, is very useful at the end of the day. I kind of showed you with the post meta thing. But let's just kind of look at my project set up here, this bigger one. All right, so I have a, a post types directory where I have an order and I have a product. So let's look at product. This is a class, a class in my namespace called product. And that, again, that's the, the joy of namespacing. This is the namespace of my plugin. So I can name this whatever I want. It's got its own full address. I can just call it product and mimic exactly what Woo has. Um, the name is typically the, what I use as the post type. Um, so this will be stored as product. That's what Woo stores it as, is as product. Um, when we construct, we can pass it into a product ID. And when we do that, we set the, what the ID is within our class, and we set what the root product is. We pull the actual root product um, object and put it within ours. So we have this wrapper where we can touch the root product, we can do our own thing. I um, it, I take it you can then just extend it? You can extend, but okay. that gives you less power. Doesn't that give you... I don't think so. I mean, it gives you the inability to overwrite function names there. You I don't want to overwrite function names. Right. I want to leave Woo functions as they are. I don't want to touch their native code. I don't want to change how their stuff works. I want to extend outward around it. Um, I, I, it gets dangerous when you start doing that because what about when the Woo upgrades and you spend all this time manipulating some function in them? That's I was saying overload. I just meant your your init is the same as their init. So, but I see the variation. Down I don't know. This is this pattern works really well for me and for coworkers and so forth, so it, it works. Um, this is a little more of a complex set of product, and it's not really tested. I, I um, haven't really needed to do this before, for, but in my mind, this would be smart. You can pull in the exact, I usually just use WC product for everything because it has all the main product methods you want, such as uh, get price, um, get property, those kind of things that you want to be able to pull from a product. Shouldn't you just return there? Return in that first if statement since you've already yeah. de de declared. Oh, never mind. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. Okay. never mind. They're all if, they're all within this. Or just declare it. Woo products. This Woo product yeah. equals. Woo There's a hundred ways to skin this cat. This was my quick rundown. Um, the get Woo product just returns our our Woo product is bundle. This is a custom function I want to have. This is something that Woo doesn't have. I'm building a bundle feature, so I want to be able to say to my product, load this product with this product ID. Tell me the price, and also tell me as a part of a bundle. I can do all that through the same variable because I have it wrapped, the Woo product wrapped in my personal product <coughs> object. Uh, get bundled product IDs. That's another method that I want to have. Um, we're going to get a little more into what this is actually doing in a minute, but I wanted to kind of show you the structure there. Uh, let me scoot this back over. So I got the post types. I, I separate post meta here. It's, that's what we do. You don't have to do that. I mean, you can, you can do it however you want. Um, it's what we like, though. And then I, I like the WooCommerce directory. This isn't something that we're directed to do at my job. This is something that developed before, before me did that I really liked as patterning, so I did it. Having your own WooCommerce director, directory to mirror objects and classes in um, Woo that aren't exactly post types, such as the cart. There's a cart class in Woo that does a lot of the cart management. And we want to be able to do some stuff with the cart as well. well let's reflect it over here. Checkout, that's how Woo labels it. Let's label it yeah. ours checkout, and that way we can stay within a grid um, as they do with the shop. We can handle our shop stuff. Um, we use service providers. This kind of keeps all our hooks and filters organized instead of having them spread throughout the whole thing. Um, you know, so here we register our instances. We, we would put within this hook filter all the different hooks we want and direct back to our class objects. Let's see an example, we just did. Uh, hook it up. So many options. Um, so this, this section I almost removed from my talk, but it's, it's got some decent stuff in it, so we'll just kind of go through it real fast. Um, nail down what you want to happen, make it happen, we talked about that already. Find the most appropriate filter action. That can be pretty challenging because there's a lot of ways to filter and hook into WooCommerce and do what you want, such as during the checkout process. You can hook into, um, payment complete, you can hook into a thank you page, or do all these things with the data of the order after the order's been completed. 
but then drilling down to exactly where you want to be in that process is it's, it's a challenge and, and it's something that you need to think a lot about as you're approaching this. You know, do you want to do this before um, the status is updated to complete it? You know it's paid, status hasn't been updated, is there something you want to do there? Or do you just want to wait till you get the thank you page and the order is completely done and in the database and set, and then you do whatever you want to do. Um, so it, 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 I don't really have a very thorough example of that, but when it comes time, if you're doing this stuff, just take some time to really dig in what filters and actions you have available to you. Uh, we all know about priority probably, but as I mentioned earlier, if you're using a filter in WooCommerce that's filtering some data, make sure you don't have any other plugins or third-party plugins that are using the same filter, and if you do, make sure you're prioritizing it right or removing their calls to it. Um, because at my very first main slide about Woo was how important this is. We're dealing with money. You want to make sure that whatever is touching your price and amount data is built by you or you know exactly what it's doing to it. So this is, it's just really important to pay attention to that stuff. Uh, the multiple passing, I, I briefly touched on this, so here's an example. When you check out through the normal checkout, it goes through um, the typical WooCommerce checkout process, it usually uses Ajax. Oh wow, I'm talking a lot. <laughs> um, typically goes through the Ajax process and checks out and that's like 90% of the time what you're going to expect to happen when somebody's going through. But again, if you're using a short code version of a checkout form in any place of your website, it's going to handle it differently. So in order to make sure that, what was this? What was this function we going to validate? So there's something you want to validate during the checkout process. Typically you look into WooCommerce after checkout validation. So we just ran this validation checks and it's saying, do you want to perform any two? And we do. And we can either return false or let it pass through and, and check out. But that doesn't work on the short code form. We had to, I had to go in and dig around and find a, an action I could hook into. And then I have to deal with this is set pay for order query string. So that, I mean, it can get a little messy dealing with WooCommerce's alternate paths that they provide people. Oh, here's another one. Uh, if you're setting your visibility of a product, don't show it in the catalog. So if somebody's on your, shop, on your page and shop around goes to the main loop, it's not going to show. And you're like, great, my product's hidden. I don't want people to see this. Well, they hit the REST API. It's not hidden. We don't do that. We don't believe they should do that. I was reading on GitHub. They're like, well, that's the REST API. That's not our business. You know, you do what you want with that. So you actually have to build out functionality to remove these hidden product visibility so items. filtering the query level on this. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty messed up. Yeah, I agree. But... You know, that's just some little kinks, and, and they know about it, and they do have a decent argument for why they don't touch this. But at the same time, you have to be aware of what's going on there. Uh, reports, these are my biggest beef with WooCommerce. Now, I love WooCommerce, I really do. I think it's a great plugin, but there are some serious issues I have with it. The report system, you know, in the admin, when you're in Woo and you go to reports, you see the great bar, bar charts and stuff showing products and your sales and all that. It's what one. System? What's that? What reporting system? If you go to the WooCommerce, no, I'm, oh. I'm being facetious. Oh, <laughs> good. There are some great third-party ones. I, I can't think of the name yeah, of it now, Maverick. but I saw them the other day. Is um, that it, Maverick? Yeah, really good ones. Easy ship for shipping. It, and it works really well, huh? Uh, awesome. It That's great. It just everything over, and you get the end users to go down and ship it. Boom, 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 boom. That's it beautiful. Them, you know, and then it comes back to when updates the status, you're done. So it's a, you go to a third-party service? Yeah. And it, and it, that's really cool. It's a long way to do it right now. Oh. Well, the default native report system is one giant query that WooCommerce puts together that does all the calculations in the SQL, adds up all the totals in there, and all this stuff, but it provides very minimal places for you to hook in and do anything. So when I had a customer that wanted to take out, they didn't want, um, we, charge a, we added a, a fee for cash on delivery, right? So we used the default WooCommerce fee object, created the fee, added it to the order, and so forth. When they went, to the reports, they don't want to see the cash on delivery fee. They're like, that didn't count for sales. We don't want that in our WooCommerce report. So it's like, okay, we'll filter it out. But it took me forever to write this ridiculous SQL injection just to pull the COD fee out of their calculations. And I mean, I guess I get it. I guess using just one quick query to get all your calculations and stuff seems great. But it provides a lot less power to the people like us who want to extend it, or even when they want to go in and, and do it differently. <coughs> you know, really dig on those reports, which is probably why they don't change it very much. Um, I don't know, I, I threw this in there because it's kind of cool, I guess. We, I was using uh, closures to filter. If you haven't done that before, you can put a function 
uh, into a variable, run it through a filter, do whatever you need, and then uh, remove that filter out. It's a really useful thing. This, I wound up not using it here because it was way easier than I thought. Um, let's talk about translations though. We have a customer that we pull the account fields out and sh it's in Japanese. They have a Japanese translation on the <coughs> website. So we show the address and all that stuff in Japanese, but then they want to show the English version of it as well underneath. They want their users to see both versions. I don't know why, but they do. They're very intent on that. So we had to unload the WooCommerce text domain, then reload in the country states um, with these guys, spit out, get a formatted address with no text domain loaded, and then reload the WooCommerce text domain, reload the states back into their data, and it would work perfectly. So just know, I don't know, I thought it was kind of cool, we can just unload it and then whatever. That's the right way to do when you need to use that. Um, this is wrong. So this was my first attempt at doing a thing in WooCommerce. So I thought that you could only see the status of an order by using the get status function, right? So that's what you typically do. get status, what's the status, you can check, blah, blah, blah. It's just a string. And so that's what I was doing. If status is not completed, return. But the bad thing about that is, what if Woo changed completed to just being complete in a future version? You know, you don't want to rely on some non-constant string for your big checks in your code. Um, but what was happening here was we, if a user was uh, loaded as Japanese as their default language, it wasn't coming back as completed. It was coming back as Japanese characters. So this check was failing every single time. This, though, you can do order has status completed, and it doesn't run through any translations. It uses, it hits up the default um, WooCommerce uh, text for it, but I still think it's wrong to be using a string completed. They should be using some sort of constant. They check a method that says is order completed or something like that. <coughs> so they're, they're probably using the untranslated version and has status. They're passing well, yeah, I went and looked in the function. They are. Yeah. But when you do get status, right. they run it through the, the translation. Raw, right, you're getting yeah. the raw status. Exactly. Um, staying compatible. <clears throat> Use core Woo functions as much as you can. Um, if they deprecate it and you're making some updates, you'll be able to see the deprecation. You'll be able to go to the, to the, the function that's being deprecated and see how Woo's changed, how they do that. Because typically that's what they do. The function deprecated, then within that deprecated function, they change it to do it the proper way that they've updated their methods to, to use. So you can see exactly what they're doing and use that and bring it out. Um, <clears throat> try, to, try to avoid direct database access. So, you know, I mean, that's a general rule for everything that you're going to be doing uh, when you're extending, especially. Um, the WC function is very useful. It's the, it pulls in the main session and cart that's currently going on, and you have a lot of access to what the user is dealing with. Don't overstep uh, WC product. With Oh, yeah. So, like, don't build your own get price function unless you need to manipulate get price. Use if you're using a wrapper class like I do, a product that wraps around the WC product, always tap into that Woo Commerce order to use that skip price method. Um, don't go, you know, trying to do what Woo's doing already. Uh, the change log is your friend. When the new version comes out, go through the change log. Um, fixing bricks. I hadn't seen this slide in a while. <laughs> yeah, your slides, fix right? your shit. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so thanks. That's it. Uh, Q and A.